Hi, thank you for joining us and welcome to our webinar on recruiting Latinx students. Uh, we're very excited to share the data and the marketing implications from this collaborative survey of the Latinx learners market. Um, I'm Kirsten Federke, Senior Vice President at Lipman Hearn, and I lead our enrollment marketing practice. And I'm Lisa DiBiase, and I'm the Local Research Director for Univision Chicago. Great. Before we get started, just a couple of quick housekeeping items. If you're having any technical difficulties, Chase Colborn is standing by in the chat area to help, so feel free to reach out to him um, to resolve any, any technical issues. Um, we also encourage you to use that chat area. Send us questions, which we will have time at the end to address, and also feel free to engage with one another in that area as well. Um, we also have a hashtag uh, set up for additional conversation at Latinx Learners, hashtag Latinx Learners, so please feel free to use that. And uh, finally, Lisa and I are going to turn off our cameras during the presentation so that hopefully you can get a, a bigger view of the slides as well as to preserve our bandwidth, um, but we'll come back on at the end for questions and discussion. Great. So to give a little context for this study, and for those of you who may not be familiar with Lipman Hearn, uh, we're a marketing and communications firm based in Chicago. We serve nonprofit clients and have a focused practice area in higher education. So we are keenly interested in prospective students, what motivates them, what their roadblocks are, and, and how we can help connect them to right fit institutions. So we invest in this and other proprietary research to help deepen our understanding of this audience and its segments. And then Univision Communications is the leading Hispanic media company, entertaining, informing, and empowering its audience with best-in-class, culturally relevant news, sports, and entertainment content available anytime, anywhere across our broadcast TV, cable TV, audio, and digital platforms. And just one more, uh, one additional note, note that we will be using the terms both Hispanic and Latinx in this presentation. Um, you'll notice that we'll use both um, to refer to the population, but that we're using Latinx to refer to the student population. And we're using Hispanic more so when we're talking about the overall statistics. It really just depends on the messaging that you're looking for. When you're messaging to students, you'll want to use Latinx. But when you're messaging to potentially the parents of Latinx students, I would say consider using um, Hispanic. Great. So our agenda for this session, um, we'll share a little bit of background on why we created um, this, this presentation and um, developed these insights. Uh, we'll share our approach to the research so you can understand the methodology um, and then what we learned about the market from the survey, um, what we learned about the market in general. And finally, we've developed a set of personas to really dive into the, the nuances of the audience. So um, as we all know, the, the Latinx student market represents a huge opportunity for higher ed. Uh, want nearly one in four high school juniors and seniors are Latinx, and that number is growing. And no two of them are the same. I think um, a, a big learning from the uh, election in November was the, the nuance within um, this market in particular, and understanding the um, specific drivers um, is, is exceptionally important. In terms of the current state of college enrollment, Latinx students represent a significant share, about 20% or 4.4 current 4.4 million currently enrolled undergrads are Latinx. And not only are Latinx students significant today, um, the growth of this segment is projected to outpace any other segment in the coming years. In fact, 64% of total enrollment growth is expected to come from Latinx students. But importantly, not only does the Latinx market represent a growing population, it's one that is predisposed to higher education. So in terms of parental expectations, 94% of Latinx parents expect their children to go to college. And 86% say it's very important for their children to earn a college degree, which is compared with only 66% of uh, non-Latinx white parents responding similarly. And 71% believe that the education their children are receiving is better than the education that they themselves received as a child. Um, and these stats have been consistent over some period of time. These aren't new beliefs, but rather perceptions that are already there. 
So this is an opportunity for higher ed marketers to catch up and reflect back to this audience's high expectations of what college can do for their kids. So with an understanding of the opportunity for higher ed market, marketers, we wanted to better understand the Latinx prospective student mindset. We wanted to explore their motivations for pursuing a degree. And as marketers, we were particularly interested in emotional drivers, which can be an opportunity to really connect meaningfully with an audience. We also wanted to understand um, their, the priorities that we would call cost of entry attributes. Um, these are things that student, students might be using as a filter to build their initial consideration set. And finally, we wanted to bring the nuances within the audience to life by creating personas. So beginning with the, the study that we conducted, um, we worked with Media Predict to conduct a week-long online survey in early October that returned over 1,000 responses from both Latinx and non-Latinx adults 16 to 45 who plan to enroll in a college or university program in the next 12 months. And something to consider with that time frame is that it, it was in October of 2020, so we're capturing sort of the new reality of being in COVID, being in the pandemic, and then also October being the time when, when you look at the those students following a traditional path, coming out of high school and looking for programs, that time where they're filling out the applications, so really capturing that mindset. And when we look at the sample, so first breaking it down by age and enrollment status, of those who qualified for the survey, nearly 60% fell into the 16 to 24 age group for both Latinx and non-Latinx prospective students. And then when we look at the enrollment, so as you can see, 20% and up to 27% for non-Latinx fell in that high school category. So those are juniors and seniors looking at programs. And then the remaining, in the case of Latinx students, the remaining 79%, um, are either not enrolled or currently enrolled. And so consider the fact that those are, that are not enrolled have either been in the workforce gaining career experience, are potentially in between jobs, especially considering everything going on right now, and are considering enrolling because of these life changes, um, or they have completed courses in the past and are looking to return to school for additional uh, coursework. And then again, the 39% uh, are currently enrolled and are potentially looking for a new program that's more robust, potentially in their major. Now, when we look at the sample breakdown for language, we see that 3% speak only Spanish, 74% are bilingual, 77% um, in general speak any Spanish, um, and then 14% of that breakout would be Spanish dominant. Now, when I say bilingual, that includes those that speak mostly Spanish, some English, Spanish to English equally, and those who are mostly English with some Spanish. So running the gamut of those three together. Um, so the overwhelming amount being bilingual. Um, and then when we look at the gender breakout, um, you will see that it does skew overwhelmingly female. Um, we do know that the education population in general skews more female than male, but we know that this is uh, slightly more of a skew um, because uh, women are more likely to fill, fill out higher education surveys than men. So when we look at the future enrollment plans, the first question we asked was, in the next two years, which of the following are you working toward or intend to work toward? So what we see is that the degree that Latinx students are most likely to be looking for is a bachelor's degree with that 48% on the left side of your screen. Nearly half of all respondents, regardless of their current status, so this is again, all respondents, are hoping to get that bachelor's. And then the next biggest bucket was the 35% with the associates. 11% are looking for a professional certificate and 6% are not sure. When we break out high school respondents, you'll see that they're even more likely to want the bachelor's degree. So that 52% uh, versus the 48% overall, and that it's also very on par with the non-Hispanic, uh, non-Latinx high school respondents. Um, and then you'll see that the Latinx high school respondents are also less likely to want the associate's degree than those overall, um, but they are more likely to want the professional certificate 21 percent versus 11 percent for all respondents and just a quick note the professional certificate really encompassed we didn't go any further in breaking that down when we asked that question so it encompasses really is based on the perception of the respondent encompasses anything from a trade certificate to a certificate that um, is very specific to a, a field of study and then for those who were not in the high school group, we asked uh, the remainder of those who are either not enrolled or currently enrolled, what were their reasons for enrolling? 
um, in their program in the next two years. So the number one response was earning a degree or certification in order to change careers. Um, and this is important to consider when targeting especially the 25 to 34 year old students. Um, and then everything else is pretty much on par with the non-Latinx respondents, although you do see that, non -Lat that Latinx respondents are slightly more likely to transfer to a college or university that has more to offer in their desired field of study. But again, that number one bucket being they're really looking uh, to go back to school um, or to start up that education in order to change their career. And then we asked about their perceptions of higher ed. So when we looked at all respondents, 74% uh, when they're rating how strongly they agree with statements about higher education said that they're looking for institutions that make sense financially for both themselves and for their family. And also ones that offer a pathway to internships, clinicals, residencies, et cetera, that would also value the work experience that they may already have. So a lot of that focus on affordability and what is it gonna do to really further um, or help them get into the career that they're looking to get right after they graduate. Um, on the other hand, when you look at specifically at the high school respondents, they are prioritizing affordability, but they also value the academic experience just a touch more than the on-the-job training. And again, this makes sense when you consider that those coming out of high school don't necessarily know what they want to do for their career. So they're looking for that sort of exploratory experience of finding out through the academics what they want to do. And then we ask the respondents, what makes a good fit? So Latinx students overall are most concerned about the affordability again and being positioned for success post-graduation and they're less concerned about the ranking, the overall prestige of the school, or the non-education related characteristics of the institution, such as the things that you see on the bottom left side, uh, such as the alumni network. So what you see, number one, being tuition and fees being affordable, 85% said that they agree that, that is, that's what makes a, a great fit for them. Just a quick note, it does rank number two for non-Latinx students. The number one there for, for non-Latinx was flexible class schedule. Um, and again, for the high school students, what we're seeing, uh, the main difference there is that they rate getting a good job after graduation higher than the affordability. The affordability still being very important, but the good job being most important and being located closer to home, lower on the list of important attributes. That's a really important thing to, to point out because there's a perception that the radius that, especially uh, Latinx high school uh, potential students are looking at is a lot smaller than what people think it is. I, I think there's a perception in the market that uh, high school students are only looking at a radius that is within a couple miles of their home or of their city, when in fact that's not the case. Um, everything that defines a good fit for them has less to do with where the school is and more to do with what is it going to do to help them um, succeed uh, post-graduation. And then we asked, what are they looking to get from higher education? So what we saw here were very high ranking emotional drivers. Um, for instance, being the most important, they wanna come out of their experience being confident and prepared for life. The number two most important um, thing that they want would be having a degree that will help them advance in their current, current job or career path. And number three, being mature, happy, and focused. Also important to note that number five was being prepared to make a difference in the world. Uh, which ranked far higher among Latinx students as versus non-Latinx. So for Latinx, it was number five. For non-Latinx, it was 13. And then the least important things are those that are the experiential. It's not about showing that they can complete a difficult program or project. It's not about necessarily having a degree or certificate from a prestigious college or university. And it's not necessarily about being admitted to a strong graduate or professional school. Again, maybe connecting back to that prestige of the university. It's not necessarily about that. It's how are they going to be prepared for life? And then we ask them about their feelings in this whole process. So in terms of enrolling in college, Latinx respondents overall said 53% were anxious, but they were just as likely to be hopeful. Um, they're also 52% said excited, 42% said stressed, 35% said confident, and then you can see that compared to the non-Latinx responses. So they were more likely to be both excited and confident than their non-Latinx counterparts, um, which really speaks to how you want to message to these students. So yes, there's some anxiety and yes, there's some stress, but really there's excitement and confidence coming into it. Um, so message accordingly when speaking to these students. Um, and then 
Um, also just important to note that stress does rank higher for high school students, which makes sense considering, again, when we ask these students to fill out this survey. And finally, we looked at the factors driving consideration. So what we saw across the board was that cost was the most important factor driving that decision. Um, but the next things in line, the next factors in line were length of time required to finish the degree, the reputation of the school, and the physical location of the campus coming in at number four, again, not nearly as important. So we went a step further and we looked at the specific preferences within each of these factors. So when we look at the time to complete the degree, what we're seeing is that among all respondents, nearly half prefer a program that can be completed in two years or less. That is heavily influenced by the fact that a majority of the respondents, remember again, 79% for the Latinx bucket, are starting or returning to school and are looking to change careers. The second largest bucket in this grouping that you're seeing is the 31% in gray uh, that would prefer the four-year program. So two-year program followed by the four-year. But when you look at the high school respondents, nearly half are looking for the four-year program, so that shifts in terms of where that weight falls. Um, and the more traditional college experience, whereas the second largest bucket is the two-year program. And then when we move to reputation, what we're seeing is that uh, reputation, again, falling is number three, cost, time to complete the degree, and then reputation being third. Um, it is most important when it comes to the major as versus the overall reputation of the school. So in that blue bucket there on the left, you're seeing 48% said that the strong reputation in the major is what's most important. And that speaks again to what we saw before, where it's not the prestige of the university or the name of the university. What's most important is the reputation of what they're investing in in their major and what they're going to get out. And that's also the case among all high school respondents. And in both cases, Latinx students are more concerned about, um, again, that reputation um, in that major. And then when we look finally at the importance of the location, what we see is that they're slightly more likely to want to be within 60 miles. 85% of all Latinx students want to be within 60 miles of their home versus the 84% for non-Latinx. But still in both cases, uh, Latinx and non-Latinx, they fell into that being the largest, the largest buckets. Um, and then specifically among high school students, again, location is less important than the overall grouping. So again, that all respondents really has a huge percentage of people that are returning to school uh, or enrolling at a different stage. Whereas when you look specifically at the high school respondents, uh, location less important. And if given the option, 77% want to be within 60 miles, while nearly one in four wouldn't mind being further away. And now we want to look at the, now that we know more about the motivations and goals, we want to look at how to reach this crucial segment. Not surprisingly, among those in the survey sample, all of the research points to digital media as the number one way to reach these students. When asked what media they spend the most time with on a weekly basis, Latinx prospective students said social media followed by the internet and TV were the best ways to reach them and what they use most often. Also important to note that the Latinx population as a whole over indexes in their mobile and social usage. So the fact that social media is number one is in line with the trend of the population as a whole. And for a more detailed view of overall reach, we also looked at the media habits within syndicated studies that we also have access to, and the results were the same. When looking at the overall reach capability of the different mediums, among all prospective students 18 to 44, internet, social media, TV, and radio ranked as the top four ways to reach this audience. And when you look at those currently enrolled, internet and social media were the number one and number two ways, with radio and TV still in the top four, but just slightly to a lesser extent. That makes sense considering how those who are currently students are spending their time, uh, more so on the internet and maybe don't have as much time for radio and TV as those who are the 25 to 44 um, who are looking to enter programs. So consider that when you're messaging to these different groups. And now we move on to the personas. Great, thanks Lisa. Um, I'm excited to introduce all of you to our personas, but before we jump in, a few thoughts to keep in mind. Um, as you may already be familiar, uh, personas are fictionalized representations of different segments of the market. Ours are data-driven and created by analyzing the characteristics of respondents who share similar behaviors and motivations. And they can be really useful to help marketers think about our audiences as real people, to, to help put a face to, to the audience and to different segments of the audience. And they can help uh, with personalizing communications. 
They can also help with channel selection and tailoring messages within channels or to different stages in the funnel. However, we also want to remain mindful of some of the potential risks of using personas. Uh, they should be used directionally, um, and by that we mean they should be used as a starting point for thinking about your audience and should always be checked against other audience insights and uh, data on, on your own audience um, as well so that we don't fall into potentially reinforcing stereotypes through the use of personas. We've developed five Latinx student personas that I'll walk you through in just a second. Um, and these personas, um, we will share uh, the aspects that differentiate each of them from the other. Um, but we also want to point out that there are aspects that they all share. And these shared aspects can give some guidance for general communications across the entire audience. Um, so what we found is um, all of these students are likely looking for emotional outcomes. And, and Lisa already pointed out um, some of these. They're looking for confidence and preparedness and, and also the expectation of happiness with a college degree. Um, but importantly, as Lisa mentioned earlier, they're also much more likely to value the opportunity to make a difference in the world than their non-Latinx counterparts. We also found that career-related outcomes are important to all of the personas as well. Getting a good job or advancing in their career are outcomes that they're all looking for. They're also all interested in developing specific skills like problem solving, leadership, and communication skills. And as we just discussed, while the prestige of an institution is less important to much of this audience, they are interested in a degree that will be respected. So they do value um, the reputation of the program or the institution to feel confident that the degree that they're earning will be respected in their community and in their workplace. Um, and they also value the full college experience. In addition to the more pragmatic career outcomes they're looking for, um, they're looking for a great experience where they can make friends and be part of a diverse community who don't all necessarily see the world the same way. And finally, we all know that cost and affordability are paramount to most students, and this holds true here as well. So with that groundwork laid, our first uh, persona is Independent Isabella. And Isabella is a Puerto Rican junior enrolled in a New York City public magnet school. Uh, she enjoys participating in service work while she's in high school and she hopes to continue um, these kinds of activities in college. She's also into theater and wants to stay involved in that activity as well. And she's built a good relationship with her high school drama teacher and has spoken with her about college. We did ask some questions about who the important influencers were um, for this audience when thinking about their college choice and um, that those who align with the Isabella persona were likely to have um, spoken with a teacher about their decision-making process. Isabella has AP credits and hopes to start college as a second-year student so that she can complete her degree in three years. She wants to earn a bachelor's degree in computer science and get a well-paying job so that she can be financially independent and eventually support a family. She recognizes the importance of academics in preparing her for a career. She'd like to live on campus, but she's not sure whether or not she can afford it. Her father has a bachelor's degree, so she's not a first-generation college student, and her family is very supportive of her college search. And in fact, Isabella is um, less likely to be showing much emotion about her college search compared to her peers, and um, we suspect that could be because her parents are showing a lot of emotion about this search process, and so she's keeping her feelings about it a little closer to the vest. Um, Isabella and her family mostly speak English at home, and in terms of media usage, she's very active on YouTube and Instagram, and she's likely to be interested in products that help her feel organized, and, and she likes having a set routine in her life. She, she likes to feel that um, she's, she's clear on the next steps ahead of her. And like most students her age, making friends and having fun are very important to her. So in terms of marketing implications for um, students like Isabella, um, there's an opportunity to really speak to and connect with these students' academic drive and their high expectations. They're looking for rigorous academics, um, as well as outcomes within each area of study. Um, but they're not solely focused on the academics, so showing the balance of academics and extracurricular activities will be meaningful to them. There's also an opportunity to really to make these students feel recruited that, like I mentioned, their their parents may be quite involved um, in their process in this process. And so really connecting with the students interests and aspirations, not just the parents is an opportunity to connect with them. And because they've had good relationships with high school teachers, um, connecting them with faculty may be an important touch point. 
Additionally, be, because there is interest in living on campus, but there's the need to really demonstrate the value of living on campus, showing the benefits um, beyond the, the fun and the social aspect, but the, the value of building the network and um, engaging with peers living on campus um, is important. And along this vein, while affordability is an important message for this segment, um, she's really uh, open to and interested in messaging uh, that's a little broader about the, the full value of the experience. So it's not just the affordability, um, but really what's the, what's the ROI, the, the opportunity here, and how can we illustrate that for this segment? Um, because she is interested in being involved in a lot of activities showing where there's opportunities, and again, tying that to the field of study. So the, the benefit and the value is greater there. Um, and again, both teachers and counselors can be um, strong influencers for this uh, segment. Our second persona is uh, Networked Enrique. And he's a 20 year old living outside of Orlando, Florida. Um, he is currently enrolled in a community college working towards his associate's degree and wants to move seamlessly into the path for a bachelor's. So he's looking for flexibility and knowing that a program will accept the credits that he's already earned. Um, he's also the most likely of our personas to be interested in things like rankings and um, third party accolades for a program or an institution. So he's looking for those markers of quality or, or ways to really understand the quality of the institution that, that he's um, going to attend. He will be the first in his family to attend college and he's really interested in setting a good example for his siblings and nieces and nephews. And he is um, likely to or may feel more connected to his ethnic heritage than even his parents do. And he speaks English and Spanish at home and with his family. And he, like the other personas, um, is a, a heavy digital user, including social media. So when thinking about connecting with Enrique, um, he is, uh, although he's not following exactly the traditional path from high school into a four-year deg degree, he is keeping his education on track and he's feeling um, confident and excited about what's next. So this is an opportunity to really reflect back those positive feelings to him and um, show that your institution is a partner to him on this journey. Um, he's also really looking for the best of both or the best of all worlds. <laughs> he's looking for flexibility and programs that are gonna support him in reaching his goals. Um, and he, uh, because he has stayed on track towards that associate's degree, um, he might be interested in messaging about the benefits of the, the more traditional aspects of a four-year degree. Um, and like I mentioned, he is more likely to be interested in rankings and, and accolades. So um, they do have a, a place in um, messaging and communications to him, although they're not the, the leading um, aspect that he's interested in. He is interested in getting to know and working with his peers, so showing opportunities um, and, and showing what it looks like to be part of the social network um, on campus or as part of the, the um, institutional community is important and showing that um, it's not just social, that it's opportunities also to collaborate and build what will become his professional network. Um, and because he has some familiarity with um, the admissions and enrollment process, showing him proactively how you will keep him on that path that he set for himself will be really important. So sharing information about transfer policies and what kind of support he'll get, not just from admissions, but even once he's in, in the classroom and part of the community, what kind of advising is available mentorship and, and others and ultimately career counseling. So um, showing him the full life cycle of the um, student support is important. Our next persona is undecided Isaac. <laughs> Isaac is a Mexican American senior in high school who lives outside of Los Angeles with his parents and siblings. Um, he's thinking about going to a community college to earn, earn an associate's degree or a certificate, but he's not really sure which yet. Um, he knows that college is important, but he doesn't have much of a frame of reference for how to make this decision, or and he doesn't have um, many people to talk to about this um, to help him sort out the answers. 
He's reluctant to ask for help, and he isn't even sure who he would um, talk to about it uh, if, if he were to reach out. He thinks he might like to pursue a certificate or a degree in medical billing because he read that that's a career with lots of stability and, and is in high demand. So he's trying to, um, to sort out these answers for himself and he's doing some research on his own to understand what kind of options might be available to him. Um, he plays guitar and is interested in music and would like to continue to um, build this skill and, and um, participate in music activities while in college. His mother took a couple of college classes, but she left school to raise her family and he would be the first in his family to graduate. And while Spanish is spoken occasionally at his home, his family converses mostly in English. So when thinking about connecting with, uh, with Isaac, um, highlighting how, um, how your institution will help support his transition to higher ed is really important and what that entire journey looks like, because he doesn't have a lot of experience or a lot of support with navigating the process, showing um, what that admissions process looks like, but also um, that he's not uh, left, left alone once, once he gets into the institution, but that he'll have support from advising and career counseling um, to ease his fears in this area. And um, he is particularly interested and, and worried about cost and affordability. So this really needs to be front and center to get into his consideration set, but um, needs to be supplemented with longer term value messaging. Again, because he's not sure exactly what kind of a um, degree or credential he's looking for, showing the longer term value of um, the, the degree type and the programs that you offer it, it will be new information for him and will be something that will help him make that decision. And he is very interested in understanding what a career trajectory might look like. So looking for careers that are stable and in demand and that align with his interests um, is something that he's looking for. Um, and like I mentioned, foregrounding admissions counseling services to make sure that he understands the process. Um, and then showing that even throughout all of the um, rigorous academics and the the out benefits and outcomes that he'll um, receive from the process, showing what uh, the full holistic student experience looks like, how he can be involved in activities, clubs, and other organizations. Our next persona is Eager Amelia. Amelia is 25. She lives in New Jersey, just outside of New York. And she wasn't sure what she wanted to do right out of high school, so she worked for a couple of years and then worked towards and completed an associate's degree in the past year. She plans to enroll in a bachelor's degree program right away. Um, so she wants to keep the momentum from that uh, initial degree she earned. And she does expect her community college credits to transfer and she's thinking that she'll enroll as a junior. And she's looking for scholarships to cover a lot of her costs. But even though she's not a traditional student, she's interested in a lot of the experiential aspects of college like social activities and student organizations. Her younger sister recently graduated from college and of the five personas, she's the most anxious about college, which uh, could be because it's bringing out her competitive nature with her little sister. She's thinking about majoring in international business and she also has an interest in psychology and foreign languages. So you can see she's excited about her interests, but not yet super focused on a particular academic path. Amelia and her family speak mostly English, um, but she really cherishes her family's cultural traditions and is interested in exploring those further. And she's even more likely to be spending time online than her non-Latinx counterparts, and she likes to feel connected at all times. So she uh, is on her phone constantly and on social networks constantly. So when thinking about um, marketing implications to connect with Amelia, showing how your college can help students really find their path. That she's bringing a lot of experience, academic and work experience in with her, but she isn't yet quite sure what that path is and what her ultimate career goals are. So um, showing uh, opportunities for students who are still really exploratory, even um, after their first or second year um, can be really helpful. Um, she also would benefit from a glimpse into the adult student experience. So how are others who look like her and have similar life experience as she does, how are they balancing school with other responsibilities? And this could be very granular, helping her understand what her schedule will look like and how she might be able to balance um, a number of demands on her time. 
and showing how examples of how courses can be customized that again because she is coming in with um, quite a lot of credit and is looking for something that's going to help her get to the next stage in her life um, showing how you can work with her to to build a schedule that works and she is interested in the um, benefits and the ROI of college education, so highlighting the experiential opportunities, whether she'll have the opportunity for internships or other hands-on experiences, and, and that these experiences in the college education will really help her hit the ground running once she does finally complete that degree. Um, and she, of all of our personas, is the most likely to uh, be interested in the alumni network as an aspect of the institution that that um, she might be interested in. So um, this suggests that she has some idea that this alumni network is meaningful to her in the future and that um, will be a benefit. So really showing her what that would look like to how the alumni network um, of your institution would, would supports current students and, and other alums and um, what that looks like in terms of career opportunities and mentorship. She's, she's ready to believe more so than the other personas. So taking advantage of that opportunity. And finally, our last persona is Gainfully Employed Gloria. And Gloria is a 31-year-old Mexican-American. She lives in Houston, Texas. She's recently divorced and has two young children. She has her high school diploma and she was enrolled at a community college after graduating from high school, but she stopped out after one semester, um, which is similar to the path that her older brother took. Um, she's thinking about completing her associate's degree within two years, and she expects the, the credits that she did um, earn to transfer. Um, she's working at Walmart right now, and she would like to move into a management position. Um, and she does know that Walmart offers its own training program, so that's an option. She's not necessarily um, as likely to see college as necessary for her career when she has other um, career training options. She's an active volunteer at her church and in her children's school, so she has a lot of demands on her time. And English is the only language spoken in her home. Um, she sees herself as someone who's willing and able to take charge of her situation and get things done. Um, so she's likely to have a feeling of, of confidence and that um, she's ready for the, the challenges and the opportunities of what the next steps might hold. And she uses YouTube, Facebook, and Instagram um, frequently. So when thinking about connecting with Gloria, um, a, a content marketing approach could be really valuable um, for this audience segment, both to demonstrate the value of a bachelor's degree in the long run and really show her um, the, the, difference, uh, the different opportunities available through a higher ed degree program versus um, a, a training program um, through another, through an employer or something similar and also her decision process may be longer. So developing that flow of content that both makes that case and also uh, gives her a flow of content over a period of time um, would be really meaningful. And she uh, would be interested in some clarification on what the, the process is to, um, to enroll and uh, what the results uh, of the education will be. And so giving some specific details on various um, options as well as outcomes so that she understands the, the choices that are available to her and how she'll make it work to get, to get enrolled. She would really benefit from seeing some specifics on how you can support her transition back into higher ed. So how she'll navigate through admissions, advising, career counseling, et cetera, especially when she does have demands on her time with her children and her church and other activities. Um, and so showing that this is all achievable for her, showing other students who are balancing similar demands and the flexibility that you can provide to help her uh, make this possible. So with that, um, we have some time to take your questions and we really appreciate you joining us today. So um, I'm gonna turn my camera back on here. Great, and I'm gonna scroll through the chat here and see the questions that have come in. Um, so the first one, someone asked, can we more precisely define social media? Um, are we referring to college marketing via social media or more of the authentic conversations and awareness of what's happening in these channels? 
Um, that's a really good question. I'll give a start of an answer and Lisa, you can feel free to chime in as well. Um, we didn't we didn't define it one way or another um, in the survey. So we did not specify whether we were talking about institutions own owned channels um, where you are um, driving the the conversation or the more organic um, places where where uh, it is a more authentic and natural conversation. So that really was up to the respondent to um, define the you know what they're they were thinking about in those areas um we believe that uh from from other conversations and past studies that uh they likely are commenting on their use of the more organic social channels and not quite so much the institutional college marketing via a social channel um that that's not likely what they were thinking of but it's possible they may have interpreted it that way correct yeah when we were talking about the survey responses it was just a simple question of what media do you use most often? So that's more to do with the, from the entertainment and or just media reach standpoint. Great. Um, so we had a question, um, someone mentioned, it's so interesting to see that Latinx students rank making a difference in the world so much higher than non-Latinx students. What does that mean for marketing and messaging to this cohort? Um, I completely agree. I thought that was one of probably the most interesting um, insights from this study that, um, from, from my perspective, I think that there are a lot of marketing and messaging implications to this and an opportunity to really connect with that aspirational, emotional um, element that could be really powerful um, with students that it's getting, it's elevating the conversation out of some of the more transactional um, aspects of the of recruitment marketing and really touching on what's driving them from that emotional level. So I think that that's a really big opportunity. I think it also potentially ties into the importance of community for this audience that they're when they're making the decision about higher ed, they're not just necessarily thinking about themselves and their own outcomes. They may be thinking about their families and their larger communities in making that decision. So they're thinking about how this um, opportunity will benefit not just them, but again, that larger community. Absolutely. That's precisely what I would say as well. It has a lot to do with, I think, Consider the fact that some Latinx students might be the first in their family to go to school within that generation, and they might not be, but for those who are, it absolutely means something different um, and something more potentially than uh, maybe a non-Latinx student who might not be the first in their family to go. Um, but that being said, I think it's also having to do with what we saw with wanting to be prepared for the career, but also, again, sort of looking in a broader perspective of what they want to get out of that experience. And it's not just means to an end it's also something that's very very special and going to take them in a completely different path um or a completely new path great um someone asked does your definition of tv include streaming services and lisa i will kick that one to you to chime in on yeah so again it really had to do with the perception of how they answered um we didn't get specific into whether they use netflix hulu what have you we know that obviously if you're talking especially the 16 to 24 year olds streaming makes up a significant percentage of any content uh consumption um so it was sort of video broadly as a um as a medium um and then you know versus radio versus social media what have you Um, this one I'm also going to ask you to chime in on. Um, someone asked, can you explain why Latinx is that works for the student population and why we should use the term Hispanic when speaking to parents? So it's really just a generational thing and it also very much depends on who you're talking to. Um, so it's, I would say Latinx is a term that, as we all know, has been adopted to really take out the gender specificity of Latino, Latina, or um, or different versions of uh, that terminology. Um, conversely, Hispanic itself is a very statistical term that is not necessarily, depending on who you're speaking to, doesn't maybe have a cultural connection, but it really just depends on the age group. So um, certain older age groups, uh, being that parent age group, might more con maybe connect with the Hispanic term, whereas Latinx to them is a very, and I'm using this very generically, but a very millennial term that isn't something that they really are ever going to use uh, but again when you're speaking to the very socially aware younger group that does truly care about that being a gender non-specific term latinx is what is relevant and maybe is what's going to 
send a message to them that you are more in touch with how they would refer to themselves. That's great. Um, and this next question is also one that I think you'll have more insight on um, about the geographic diversity of the study. And um, if we have any um, data on urban versus rural, east versus west, et cetera, and how our, our sample uh, is distributed. Yes, so for this, uh, we didn't ask urban versus rural in this context. Um, it was a national survey and it is dispersed. We do see that a lot of the responses in this case, because of it just being a week long survey, um, did capture a lot of responses from the coasts, um, but that it didn't necessarily get as many respondents. Um, so I'd like to do this survey again, maybe in a longer time period to see if we could sort of fill in uh, some of those gaps. Um, but we can break it down by east versus west and by central in terms of the region. It would just make the sample a bit smaller, but that's not to say we wouldn't have insights from those areas. That's great. Um, so another um, participant um, sent in, while I recognize the importance of individualizing and personalizing marketing, how do you know which population your students are falling into? Um, this is a really good question, and I think that this is one of the, the biggest challenges with kind of wrapping your head around how to use personas, and I think there are a lot of different answers to that, that um, for institutions who um, have very sophisticated data, um, data gathering and, and analysis um, opportunities, that, that there is potentially the opportunity to gather data and tag individual students um, according to a, a system to start to identify um, a persona that is important to your institution that they may fall into. But that isn't necessarily possible for, for very, very many institutions. Um, it's just a tremendous amount of data and a lot of infrastructure to set up to um, build and maintain those personas. Um, so I think they can be used um, a lot more, more generally, that when thinking about your communications, um, thinking about um, are you hitting the bases for a, a bunch of these personas in various channels, um, knowing that there are the variety of interests and the variety of life experiences that are reflected in these personas, do you have something that speaks to them in your comms flow? So even though you don't necessarily know exactly who's who, um, you can use these as a filter for evaluating your comms flow to make sure that you have a little bit of something for everyone, so to speak. Um, and on the flip side of that, if you build personas or identify personas that you know are a really good fit for your institution, that they'll be successful there, that they'll thrive there, um, you can really then key your communications to speak directly to the interests and needs of those personas that you really want to hone in and focus on. Um, you also can use personas when thinking about um, uh, which, what, which messaging to deploy in which channel. So all of these Latinx learners are very digitally active. So this is a little bit less of a differentiating opportunity, but sometimes with personas, if if there's one that we find is more likely to be listening to radio, for example, then if buying radio advertising is something that's part of your plan, you can develop the messaging um, for that channel to speak specifically to that audience. So, um, so these are some of the ways to think about using personas, even if you don't necessarily know at an individual level which, which prospective student is falling into which audience. Um, oh, there's also one other idea that, um, that I really like is um, there's also potential to have students uh, self-identify that without saying that you're trying to funnel them into a specific persona, having engagement opportunities like, you know, quizzes on your website or um, questions that they can answer um, to help kind of identify what's a priority to them um, and what their, where their interests really lie, that those can be designed according to personas and can help you filter individuals into specific communications flows. Absolutely. And the only thing I would add to that is, you know, it could also be super effective to have multiple messages coming out depending on your program. So depending on the programs you're offering, whether it's a, the professional certificates or it's the undergrad program, you can use multiple messages across multiple, let's say it's TV radio stations, for instance, and you can get the, there's ways to easily track. So is your commercial on one station that has maybe a slightly older average age leading to a better direct response to the website? Um, if you message on, you know, use your one messaging for maybe those 25 to 34 year old students who are career changers versus having another message for the same exact university or college or program, but 
messaging then to the bachelor, uh, the prospective students who are looking for the bachelor programs on maybe more of your younger skewing stations. And there's ways to track that to see where best to place that media. Um, so that's number one. And then number two, just remembering that um, across all these different mediums, you can, there's a broad way to promote. And then also, again, using those different, different programs that you have that could really resonate and change up that messaging to speak to each one of these personas um, in both a broad and very specific way, depending on how many messages you want to have out there. Mm -hmm. Um, there's a really interesting question in here. Someone said that they're really interested to dig in on the why of some of the persona statements, and I would agree. <laughs> um, for example, they say, why um, does does one persona look for markers of quality? What does that do? Does that build his confidence, etc.? Um, and and I think that is a really good question. And you know, the, these personas are the result of a bit of the the art and the science of um, looking at the data that uh, we. We developed the, the personas um, based on um, specific elements within the data, um, but then we we drew some interpretations from that based on our experience of talking with prospective college students all over the country. And so, um, so some of this we don't necessarily know from the data why one thing is more important than another, but we can start to make some um, some speculations based on experience. Um, so for that persona in particular, there's one for whom, um, and I believe it was uh, networked Enrique, who uh, was slightly more interested than the average in things like um, like rankings and accolades. And that is from the data. We asked how important um, are these various factors in your decision-making process? And he was more likely to have said that rankings are important. So, so we know that they're important to him for that reason. In terms of why is he looking for that? There's a lot that we tried to build from the other data points as well as from our experience of trying to understand that he has been engaged in higher ed um, on a pretty consistent pathway. So he's been through this um, admissions, recruitment and admissions process before. He's probably seen data points like this used as proof points um, for quality. So he's a little bit more familiar with um, how institutions tend to describe themselves or what data points they try and put in front of um, prospective students. So he has a little more experience with, um, with rankings and understanding what that even means and how to interpret it. Um, and I think also he, uh, networks are important to him. It's part of his, his persona name. And um, so he gets a lot of information through word of mouth about the college search and he, um, you know, he has a lot of inputs that are based on the reputation of an institution, that he's getting opinions of influencers in his life that may have read about an institution that's highly ranked or, you know, maybe using that um, to, to filter what they pass on to him. So, um, you know, we're sort of uh, trying to build an understanding of that why, and I agree with the commenter here that, that that's a really important piece of this and an opportunity um, like we said at the beginning, to, to build on these personas or, or shift them based on your own population as you understand those whys that help connect with, um, with students more meaningfully. Yes, and then that last question, uh, wondering why none of the five personas represented students who are perhaps more fluent in Spanish than English. So if you, um, when looking back, um, so Networked Enrique and then Undecided Isaac both had uh, Spanish usage at home, but remember too that you're we're looking at a population, especially for the 16 to 24 year olds, that are it's very bilingual. So, but that doesn't mean that they don't speak Spanish with their family or consume content in Spanish. So, outside of their home, English may be the preferred language. Um, and in terms of how they're transacting, it might be in English, and much of their education would be in English. Um, but from a cultural standpoint and connecting, speaking Spanish is still of importance. So usage and consumption might be two very different things and also how they speak with their family might be different um, but we do say too though that spanish is also uh, keep in mind that you're speaking to two different audiences when you're talking about uh messaging to this audience so you're messaging to the students but you're also messaging to the parents which plays such a crucial role in that decision process especially when you're talking the, the juniors and seniors in high school or those maybe just a step older than that that the family is playing a big role. And so the parents may be more likely to speak Spanish. And again, and more likely to consume 
Spanish language content. So uh, again, always important to remember um, that um, even if you see that the student itself uh, is very bilingual. Great. And we had a question of if each of the personas is attached to a segment, and if so, what are the percentages for each segment? And Lisa, you may have this at your fingertips, but my memory of it is that they are fairly equally divided. Um, the, the, there wasn't uh, one that was significantly larger or smaller than the others, but I may not be remembering that exactly correctly. Yes, I would have to get back to you on that. I'm not sure of the exact percentage there, um, but I do see that one other question too, sort of related to that. So um, it says, but I didn't hear persona for Salvadorian, Guatemalan, Nicaraguan, so on and so forth. So it really just has to do with the fact that because a majority of um, Hispanics in America are Mexican, uh, when the personas were created, it's using whatever's the most likely of the respondents to have responded. So it's not to say that um, the question was, are these considered a part of the adult student market or in this case, the Latinx student market? And absolutely. 100%. It just had to do with likelihood of these, um, all the different characteristics matching up. And statistically, that's just how the likelihood worked out with our respondents. But, um, but yes, absolutely. Great. Um, we have uh, probably time for one more question here. Um, and somebody has asked any insights on how these marketing implications would change, if at all, at the graduate level. Um, that's a really great question. All of our respondents were interested in pursuing an undergraduate degree, either an associate's, uh, bachelor's, or a, a certificate of some sort. So graduate prospects were not in this data set specifically. Um, I, I, I suspect that um, a lot of the desired outcomes that are more of the emotional outcomes and things like that desire to change the world and um, you know feeling really confident in the next steps i suspect that those would translate for the graduate audience so from an emotional and messaging perspective of looking to tap into those um sort of deep desires for their their future i suspect that that would still be really relevant um a lot of the uncertainty about the process that we saw come up in a lot of the personas where they're looking for really specific information about application processes and how they're going to be supported through this process and this transition back into higher ed. I suspect that that would fall away at the graduate level, that they've been through the process at that point and have a bit more confidence um, in the more transactional nature um, of the, the, the decision making. Um, so I think that there's pieces of this that would hold true for a graduate audience and others that um, maybe would be less important um, once they're at that higher level of, um, of their academic uh, their academic journey. And we hope to follow up with a study, much like the way that we did this study, we hope to follow up with that because we have received um, a number of questions about that. So hopefully we can do this and present this again with the graduate level responses. I would love to do that too. That would be really interesting. Great. Well, I want to be mindful of everyone's time. We really appreciate you joining us uh, for this today. And Lisa and I would both be happy to hear from any of you. Our email addresses are on the screen, so feel free to reach out to us. Feel free to keep the conversation going on Twitter or LinkedIn and use our hashtag. And uh, we will be sending up a follow-up email with um, a link to this uh, recording as well as a microsite with a lot of this information as well. So. Uh, we hope to uh, hear from all of you, and I hope that this has been helpful, and uh, have a great afternoon or rest of your day. Absolutely. Thank you so much.